Welcome to The Roll Forward, a podcast for the next wave of finance leaders, especially those looking to transform their roles by making smarter, faster, and more profitable business decisions using the power of technology and a forward-looking approach to finance. Listen in to learn how to get out of the back office trenches and become a more strategic partner within your organization. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Roll Forward Podcast. My name is Joe Michalowski and this episode is brought to you by Mosaic, a strategic finance platform that transforms the way business gets done. And today my guest is Scott Mollett, Consulting VP of Finance at Ativo Partners. Scott, thank you for joining me today. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Excited to kind of talk with you about uh, what I do with Ativo. And and uh, I sorry, I do want to make a little correction. I, I, I am officially CFO with... Uh, Oh with, my God. Uh, Ativo. Yeah. Amazing. Well, sorry about that. I looked it up. I was wrong. All right. CFO, even better. Love it. Thank you for correcting. I should have asked first. Well, love it. This is actually great for the first question, which is always mind giving everyone the quick background about yourself and how you became the CFO of Ativo Partners. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, background, I like to go back to the college days. I went to UCLA in LA and I had an easy path staying with one of the big six accounting firms down in LA, being part of manufacturing, banking, or the entertainment industry. But I chose the harder path to come up to the Silicon Valley and be part of the tech scene. So, you know, had less opportunities to come up here, but I was able to get one and went to KPMG on the audit assurance side typical kind of growth path to come through the accounting finance ranks, knew fairly quickly that I wanted to be more of a rule breaker than a rule enforcer. So jumped into startups fairly quickly. And for about 14 years, I, I went in and out of various startups, you know, covering industries from online marketing, e-commerce, and uh, consumer software, or even biotech stint. And at the end of one of my last in-house uh, gigs, the company was acquired. I was CFO of that, that company and the acquiring company had a team already in place. And so, you know, I was redundant and I took some time off yeah. and I was thinking, you know, through my journey up until that point of, you know, you just get, go into these startups, you're, you have very little resources and you're, you're trying to keep your head above water. So, it, you know, one, have I been doing things right? And two, how do I kind of be able to have some support and work with a team? So coming out of that experience and that time off, I, I joined a consulting firm, which now the founders are, it came, there, came from there to a found Ativo and really enjoyed collaborating, working on different clients, seeing how, how other folks get to do things. Because when you're a team of one at a startup, you, you're pretty siloed, like you're your network is busy. It's, it's hard to kind of check in with folks. So it was, I was at that first consulting firm for about four years. And then I had the opportunity to go back in to startups. And I was I did a stint with Lime, the, uh, the, the micro mobility company. And that was the, my big classic, you know, Silicon Valley growth story working there. And then I had the opportunity to rejoin my colleagues back at Ativo after, after that was founded and, and have been at Ativo for about four years now. Love that. I love, I, I really enjoy hearing the, the backgrounds where when I always say this, but like for me personally, it's just, it's been a pretty linear like a path for how I got to where I am. There's not a lot of like meandering through industries and kind of like finding my way in different stages of growth. Uh, so yeah, I really enjoy hearing all that and excited to talk more about some of these like consulting services that you provide because for us i mean i we talk to a lot of like you know early to to mid stage to like later stage startups and everyone knows that like you kind of start out with this you know finance is kind of the afterthought in the earliest stages and so you end up like oh we'll get like an outsourced bookkeeper and we'll get an outsourced like maybe a fractional cfo and so i was excited to chat with you about sort of working with fractional CFOs or consulting services and kind of scaling from that point to bring the in-house team. So do you mind just setting the stage by explaining sort of like the when you typically engage with a company in this consulting fashion and why you think it's so valuable to, to start earlier rather than later getting finance and accounting right? I'll, I'll, I'll speak, you know, specifically to Ativo because because yeah. different firms have different strategies and, and different skill sets and, and where they kind of come in to play with with the companies they work with. At, at Ativo Partners, we 
work with seed to series C companies, that's kind of the sweet spot. And usually what will happen is a VC will fund one of their portfolio companies. There'll be a bookkeeper in place or friend of the friend of the founder, or maybe, maybe one of the, a, a platform service that's, that's in place. And we'll, they'll need to kind of upscale the finance and accounting services. So, you know, a typical, you know, foot in the door type of a, or, you know, foot in the door type of engagement would be raise, raise the current round of funding, come in, do some cleanup, get ready for the next board meeting, get ready to raise some debt on top of the equity and start to put in some next, you know, the next level of scaling finance and accounting hygiene. Gotcha. Uh, I want to, I want to talk about uh, digging a little bit more on like what that engagement looks like. Cause last time we chatted, you talked about kind of like the, the tops down versus bottoms up sort of engagement flow. I would love, I enjoyed our chat about that. I would love for you to just go through like what those are, what they entail. And then I have a follow-up question that I think will be a little interesting. Great. Yeah. Happy to do so. So again, what I, what I kind of first described here was what I'll call accounting first engagement. So coming in to do the blocking and tackling, you know, set up the compliance, get a, get a, get a cadence for a monthly close, start showing some next, you know, visibility into the financials, more more nuance and, and, and so the founders can see what's going on in their business, set up a monthly close process, make sure that, you know, again, on the compliance side, everything's is buttoned up. And as the company scales and grows, they'll, they'll, they'll run into more complex issues, start tackling rev rec, maybe, maybe they're pre revenue. And so then we have to build out policies and procedures to help scale revenue. And then as the team grows, you know, get more deep into policies and procedures around spending. So that would be you know, what I call the accounting first engagement. Then, then, you know, we get to do not as, as often, but maybe more often as, as we grow the firm, we get to do more FP and a first type engagement. So I was with a client where they had to raise their series B and they had a advisor that, that was part-time they built you know, a, a rough model that, that helped them operate at the current stage, but not a model that they could leverage to go to the VCs and raise a series B round. So I came in as a team, you know, as a, as the head of finance, essentially, or VP finance, essentially at that, at that stage and walked them through the process, built the financial model, helped them raise their series B round. And as that process was, was unfolding. The bookkeeper w was not able to keep up. The, the company was just scaling, you know, or uh, as, as we are trying to raise money at the same time, brought in the accounting team to, to help shore up the transaction volume and get, and get things back on track. And then in, in the process, help, help find a controller for them. So we, we have services at Ativo where we can help, um, help folks do the recruiting and, and build out their team. And in that process, all in a, fair, in a fairly short period of time, usually our engagements would be, you know, call it maybe around three years is, is a kind of a typical engagement. This one was, was quicker in the sense that the controller came in. The, it's a very hands-on business. It was a hardware, hardware business. They, the controller needed more help, you know, next to them, so, you know, at, at the office. And then they hired a VP of finance internally that again, because of the complexity of the business, they needed the folks in house. So that, that, that cycle was fairly quick, but, a, but a, a great engagement for us. Love it. I, th my follow-up question is, and I, I, it's a little bit leading because I, I kind of know your personal preference, but I know there's no like right answer, but I'm curious if you have a, a personal preference on which approach you would like to take from, uh, like a new client standpoint, that accounting first or that FP and a first, is there a better way, I guess? So, so I wouldn't say there's a better way. Now, if you're saying my personal preference, I, I, you know, I didn't stay in it at KPMG to do audit assurance. I am, you know, I respect gap. I don't like gap, but I respect it. So, so, so that's, you know, an accounting function. So I'm very much more FP and a thinking about financial modeling, more strategic engagement. Now you need to have great accounting in place and great hygiene. Otherwise, you know, call it garbage in, garbage out. You don't have data to, to be informed and, and make strategic decisions. 
So, so my preference is a FP&A first type of engagement. It's, it's more exciting for me personally, but there is no right or wrong answer. What, what, what's exciting about a TiVo. And, and if you think about different uh, firms is we're fully integrated, we're accountants to CFOs, right? And so we can handle the day to day if that's all our client needs, or we can come in and just be strategic if that's what our client needs, depending on what. And then as the clients evolve, if, if they bring in pieces in house, we can, we can flex and, and, and work around that. So, you know, what, what's more important when you think about doing fractional work is being able to understand, you know, what is one, what is the client's view on accounting and finance? And typically it's like, why would I spend money on that? Because I have to build a product and I got to, you know, build my team. Oh. And then, and then two, really get a sense of where they're at in, in their, you know, makeup of their accounting and finance activities. And so what's interesting is, and I thought about this, you know, we, you, you did share this question with me ahead of time. And, and I, and, and I have another way to think about this is, and, and I've experienced this is when you do accounting first and you get a warm intro from a VC, there's, there's, it's, it's like, okay, we get to dip our toe in, in, in the pool here and just start working and start doing a light, you know, light touch into a, a you know, a, a larger engagement with a company. And along that way, you're building trust from, you know, building the building blocks. And so I'll start with accounting, you know, in an accounting engagement and they'll say, you know, don't spend any money. Don't spend any money. Don't spend any money. I go, good guys, let's, let's have a moment here and say, how about I give you a little bit of insight on this topic? And I think one of the things that I like to do is, is get a bottoms up cash forecast in front of folks where they know not, not what are you spending on your software, but who are you actually spending your money with? Like you've got 50 vendors here, you know, this guy's 10 bucks a month and this guy's a thousand a month. And and all of a sudden they look at it and go, why, you know, why are we still paying for this and what's going on here? And, and, oh, why don't we have this system in place? And so now all of a sudden the light bulb goes on and there's this level of trust. And then they start coming to us with the strategy like, oh yeah, I didn't realize you could do this and so forth. When, when you go for a strategic first engagement, especially if you're going, jumping right in to raise a round of funding, you know, this is an exciting and stressful time for the founder and they have to make a pretty quick decision that, oh my gosh, you know, I can't get this wrong. I got to work with this person of all the people in the world. I got this person I got to work with and we got to get it right. And so I, I kind of, I, you know, in a, in a crude way to think about it, I almost think of it as a shotgun wedding, right? You know, there's, there's a, you know, in the accounting first, uh, in example, you know, we're dating, we, we have this long, long, long time to get to know each other. And then we decide, okay, fine, let's go get, you know, Let's go get married. Where is the shotgun wedding? Who knows the circumstance of the shotgun wedding, but it's now all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're hitched and it's, it's intense. And it I, can't uh, be intense. I, I love the analogy. It makes a lot of sense to me. I think, you know, for you, and, and we're going to dig more into this, I'll, I'll let you focus on the FP and a side. Cause personally, I mean, we talk about strategic finance and kind of moving things in that direction. So I also don't want to talk about gap and kind of putting compliance in place, but <laughs> I mean, at least from, from my perspective too, it's like, you know, you want to dive in and do the like heavy work, the exciting work, but you know, without that first piece in place, without all of that compliance, like it is incredibly important. And so we have plenty of episodes that are about setting up those accounting workflows. So go listen to those. We're going to focus on fp &A because I believe Scott and I just want to let's, let's call it that. <laughs> so with more interesting. Yeah, exactly. So with this deeper interest in, in like the fp &A side of things. And you meant, you've mentioned a few examples, but I would love uh, to, for you to go a little deeper on like some of the strategic projects you work with clients on, on that fp &A side. Like how are you coming in on that strategic level and setting them down the right path to growth? I would love some more examples. Well, you know, there's, there's a couple of table stakes, I think, on the fp &A side. One is, is budgeting, forecasting, planning, financial modeling, right? So helping understand the business, helping founders deciphering founders, what they're trying to do, and then understanding where the, what are the knobs and the dials that you can work with to make an impact on the business. So everything from pricing models and studies to, to thinking about working capital issues and, and where, where cash comes into, into play. Do we have a lot of upfront costs that we're not going to get paid back until the end, 
or on the back end, or or can we flip that model and can we actually you know use our customers to help finance the business in scaling and growing? Like, w- what's dependencies? Like, what are the dependencies if if you're you know I, I think one of the things I like to do with founders as we start going down the path of of putting together a financial model is do we really understand what our north star metric is? Have we coordinated with the board? Have we coordinated with the team? Do we know who our competitors are? Do we know, you know, what we need to go after? And when you have that North Star metric, everything's just start cascading from that. So in order to, re- re- you know, if we're growing ARR, right, we want to, our, that's our metric. We, we have, and we have a product with our customers. What is engineering's responsibility? Is it, is it, is it building a stickier product? Is it building a new functionality? Is it building a whole nother product, you know, product line to, to grow that? And what are those steps it takes? And, and one of the things that was interesting at, at, at Lime, you know, being in house, I had, I had, you know, we, we got to drive around and go to our, our markets where we launched and, and we, we, you know, we carpool with different folks. And I carpooled one time with a junior engineer and he's like, why, you know, I have, I have all these competing requests from my manager. And I said, okay, well, what is, what's our number one goal we're trying to achieve? And that is how you decide what to do, right? So if I have two tasks and I understand the North Star metric, if one task is better serving the North Star metric than the other task, then your decision's easy, right? And then you just get aligned that way. So that, that cascades all the activities you have to do ends up becoming a hiring plan. So I need these resources either internally or externally. I need to bring on a project. I have a CapEx requirement to, to get this done. And that's kind of the, the, you know, step one, I would say step one is understanding the North star metric, understanding what each department is, is contributing to get there. And then from there resource that. And so that's 80, you know, call it 70 to 90% of your costs right there, right? The headcount. Then the rest is, you know, you could almost put an overhead factor for, for the rest of it, you know, at a high level, but you know, there's, there's other things that, that you start layering in to get to the rest of the budget and in the, in the financial model. I love this, uh, this focus on the North star metric. I mean, I, obviously like people listening to this, you know, our, our audience at Mosaic is, you know, those early to mid stage startups. So everybody has competing priorities. So it's a really good example because even like in my, in my job, it's like, could I, you know, decide to really scale this podcast or should we spend more time scaling like our SEO efforts, like what's driving the pipeline, what's going to drive the business forward. And so you're right, it does help me and helps everybody, I think, kind of align the efforts. And maybe this is the answer. So maybe it's uh, my next question is really about like the common issues or areas of weakness that clients have on the FP&A side when you join them is, is it finding like deciding what that North Star metric is, or is there something else that seems to be like a more common issue that you have to clean up? You know, I think, I, I think that is definitely one you want to be aligned on the North Star metric. And it's really hard to say, pick that one thing, but you, you really want to get to the one thing. I mean, if, if, if there's three initiatives and they're all kind of like leading you in the same direction, then that's, that's, that's great. You know, as you can manage that. But if you, if you think there's three initiatives, and they're pulling in different different directions, then then there's a lot of conflict in what you're trying to get done between the teams and 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 trying to resource that right. So how do you how do you focus those resources? I think one of the the challenges that a lot of early stage companies have is is their you know data infrastructure and the data that you're going to you know tr- derive from to to build the plan to track the plan to to hold people accountable. And I think that's that's probably the biggest challenge and. You know, some of it is just time. You just, you just, you just don't have enough bodies to, to get it done. So how do you be efficient in that way? You, you know, everyone talks about bringing on systems and automation and all this stuff, and that's great. But if you don't have the, the owner or the stakeholder to, to drive that and keep that clean, you know, it, it doesn't, it's, it's still garbage in, garbage out. And it's challenging. I mean, it, it may help overall, but, but again, you want to have that stakeholder who has the time and, and the responsibility to make sure that data is clean. You know, we'll see, we'll see stuff coming out of Salesforce all the time. And it's like, I, how do I, how do I make sense of this? Like, what is, you know, the booking part is easy. Everyone can tell you, Hey, I, I'm going to sign a contract on this date and it's worth this, but how do I derive like how this rolls out from Salesforce and where then I do I have to do it? Does this go back into Excel or Google sheets? And then, 
you know, how do I manipulate that and track that? And that's the challenge. Yeah, we spent, I think it was probably this time last year, maybe, or maybe early this year. I don't know. Time, time is a construct. I lost track of when things happen, but <laughs> we did this big project on CRM hygiene for this exact reason, because it was like, you know, all these people, like they come in, they want to use Mosaic and it's like, oh, well, like you look at their Salesforce data because it's so like the blessing and the curse of Salesforce or any CRM is like totally customizable. You can do anything in it. It's like, wow. That's amazing. But also for finance people, it's like, no, it's not really that amazing. That means like could be a mess in here. You could just be uploading docs like there's no actual like field set up. And so I'm glad you brought that up as as an example, because we have thought uh, a lot about trying to get customers to to kind of up level their their CRM hygiene game. It's a tough one. That's a, it's a really you know, tricky I have one. A, I have a client I'm working with who's who's on on Mosaic and and we're trying to use Salesforce as a driver of the model. Of course. And and it's it's you know we kind of had to put pause on it for for the for the moment just because it, it it is very, you know, the the company I work with rolls out deployments across a large organization and, and the timing of how that gets deployed has a huge impact in the business model of like oh, and, and decision making like what you know do you know we have a few products to choose from one's higher 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 margin but if i can roll out a lower margin one faster what does that do and you can't you can't run that as salesforce at, at least at least out the box for sure totally. and so so it's there's a hybrid type of a relationship between salesforce and, and mosaic and and google sheets i guess it's a little game there to get that to work it is, uh, to your point, you mentioned a couple of times, garbage in, garbage out. It's like the, that data infrastructure is, is so important. And maybe that's a part two of this, uh, this conversation, because that's a whole separate issue that we could probably talk for another hour about. Uh, so I don't want to get too deep in the weeds on the data infrastructure, but it's a good one for sure. I, 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 will, say, I will say something that I get on a soapbox about and, and people roll their eyes at the firm every time I start talking about this is, is I ask folks, you know, what is, what is QuickBooks? What is, what is Zero? What is NetSuite? And if someone tells me it's an accounting system, then they don't get it. It's a database. Okay. It is a hundred percent a database. And so I have a very rigid way of looking at it. And in the sense of, you know, there's certain information you want in the memos. There's certain info, there's certain ways of, of approaching transactions. Of course, it pays your bills. Of course, you can, you know, collect, you can pay payroll. Of course, you could do those things. But if you don't structure the way you approach the data, then it, you know, I, I want it where I don't need someone to spend hours to, to do a transaction. Someone can spend a few extra keystro- keystrokes and save me a ton of time on the back end where I don't have to like double click into something and say, oh, I understand what that is. It's in the right period. I can trend it out and oh, great. And, and literally, you know, out of the box reporting out of most of these systems is, is good or okay, but I'll take data dumps out of, out of these systems and run pivot tables and have the analysis where people now have the aha moments and they can see how things are, are coming together in a, in a, in a more powerful, more meaningful way. I love the soapbox. I'm right there with you. I, <laughs> as somebody who doesn't work in finance accounting, I probably would have gotten the answer wrong, but the way you describe it makes a lot of sense to me. Um, especially just with what we talk about here at Mosaic, like the, you know, we talk a lot about the modeling and the analysis and like all the like cool things you can do, but the data integration piece, like if you go to our website, like it's really all you should be looking at if you're starting. It's like, what do you integrate with? Oh, all my systems. Great. Like this is, this is step one and better clean those up because yeah, it's the root of everything. I I can't even imagine what you're, I, I couldn't even imagine being a, a support part of the support team at, at a mosaic or a company like that, where you're dealing with all those integrations. I mean, maybe AI is the answer. Hopefully the AI is the answer at some point. I even, you know, but that is, um, that takes a certain someone to really want to kind of dig into that data and unwind, uh, you know, the spaghetti and, and get it kind of straightened out. We have a uh, shout out to Caleb and his team, Gracie Cosmo and everybody else. Like we have some incredible data people in here. And I know recently we did an episode uh, talking to one of our co-founders who also is kind of spearheading those efforts, Brian Campbell, and talking about Stripe data and kind of making sense of Stripe data. And I, I, it's always really interesting for, to talk to them because as somebody that I'm, I'm just on this side, I, I, I see the j- dashboards and the charts and they're like, 
you don't know what's going on behind all that. And it's like, there's so much mess, like in all of these systems. And so you're right. I mean, I, I don't envy anyone in those positions, but I am very lucky to be at a company where we have them because man, every time it's they're they're some of the smartest people I've ever met. And I, I don't know how they do what they do, to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we, we, we definitely at the firm have a lot of love hate with with Stripe and, and how it gets set up and how we, you know, because that's the source of truth. And yep. so it's, 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 you know, you have to work with it, you have to figure it out. And so obviously, depending on how, how where you and that's, and, and I think we, we talked about like, you know, or, or I don't know if the questions coming up, or you shared some questions with me, or if we already kind of touched on it, but that's part of kind of the hygiene, right? It, mm. The sooner we can come in and help you know, provide some insight into, you know, how to set up these systems or what's important because usually this, that what's important with a lot of the systems is the engineering team or the founder thinking what they want and it's their, their frame of reference, which obviously that, that is cr critically important, but, but once you go down the path of setting something up in that way, it, it, there's a lot of pain in, in trying to restructure things to scale it for, for the future growth on, especially on what, in what accounting and finance needs. Yeah, that's, uh, <clears throat> it was, uh, you know, something I, you know, we started, we talked about this in, in the beginning a little bit. It's just like, why is it so important to, to get finance and accounting right as early as possible? And it's what we talk about because, you know, I did an episode with the CFO of a company called Galley and he talked about the CRM cleanups project. So like it wasn't, Hey, here's how to set up your CRM for success. It's, Here's how I went back in three years of CRM data in, in Hub, for him it was HubSpot and had to clean everything up. And it's like, that's the value of like working with someone like yourself at Ativo and getting this right early is that you don't have to go back through years of contracts and data entry just to, just to get to the starting point, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge. I mean, we, you know, we, it's not the fun part of, 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 you know, being a fractional totally. accounting and CFO is, is doing the cleanup. It's, it's, it's obviously painful budget wise. And, and it's, it kind of delays, it takes time for us to be able to kind of really get our stride because we got to spend time going through the cleanup being, you know, from the accountant side of the brain, it's, it's, it's nice to clean things up and, and, and get to move things forward. But it's like, there's always something that's just like, oh, it's just not quite right being coming from the accountant brain. But you have to let it go and you say, okay, this is, this is, you know, good enough. And, and over time we'll, we'll clean things up. We just can't like dive in and, 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 and spend the budget like that right away. Yeah, exactly. I did say that we were going to spend more time talking about the FP&A side and we kind of like started towing the line about just like data cleanup, things like that, which is, I mean, important to FP&A, but it's not actually the FP&A part. So the, the, the question I want to ask you is like, You've mentioned this a few times, kind of like the, the engagements where somebody comes in and you need to get them to the next round of funding. I want to talk a little bit more about that because we, we've been talking a lot about funding. We're kind of in the, the way the market is working, like the peak of venture funding was like early 2021. We're like 18 months removed from that. And now like all those companies are coming due to like raise again in some less than stellar market conditions, we'll say. So I'm curious, like, what are some ways that you can help set them up for success when that is like the main goal? They come to you and they're like, hey, like we're starting with you. We need to get to our series A or our series B or whatever it is. Like, how do you set them up for that success? You know, again, going back to having a good financial model in place, having a good story to tell. So, you know, the the founder has a vision and and it's very easy to, for them to talk about customers and and TAM and market opportunity and the excitement around the product and showing the demos, but the financial story has to kind of match that. And so making sure that, that we're taking into account all, all the pieces that will come together in, in that, in that process, you know, being a, an advisor and, and a partner with, with our founders, you know, we have, we have networks of folks, obviously we're tied in with the VCs. So where can we make introductions and, and help? you know, help them get, get in front of uh, potential investors. How can we approach the, the tough questions? You know, I'm, I, I'm working currently on, on, on five fundraisings at different stages with, with my clients. And, you know, there's one end of the spectrum where 
a VC just came to the client and said, here, take my money. And they're okay. saying, okay, great. And then we just really just worked on diligence and got, got the paperwork. And we're on, a, on the other spectrum size where, you know, we're, we're asking the existing investors to lead the round and, and they are, are really digging in hard and saying, do I want to double down in this investment? Is this really the right thing for our strategy? And so how do we kind of like guide those conversations? How do we give, how do I give the founders the information so that they can, they can go through that, that tough process, go through the tough questions and really, you know, show, you know, ultimately, ultimately the VCs want to see, you know, revenue opportunity and growth. And if, if there's a one or two year path of development, how, how do we get past that? How do we show that? How do you give them the confidence that, that this is going to lead to this development work and this, this, this money spent is going to lead to a positive outcome in, in either revenue growth or, or building some IP that, that, that will be desired by a company who can c scoop it up. So it, it's, uh, that, that's where kind of the, the nuance and challenge comes in. Yeah, we uh, actually this week on uh, this Friday, July 21st, it was Tuesday. So the 19th, we did a webinar with uh, Omer's Ventures. So they, they led our Series C. And so it was like a Q&A and, and that was something they harped on a lot when answering some of the questions it was like, hey, like as an investor, we are looking to make like, like we know it's a long term partnership. So like they, there's an understanding that like just because the market conditions are bad doesn't mean your Series B investment is going to be like paying massive dividends next year. So like there's an understanding, but you like from the finance side, from the FP&A side, yeah, you need to show, like you need to be more diligent about showing that path to how you do become the the windfall that they're looking for because yeah, it's a lot stricter out there than, than maybe it was a year or two years, three years ago. Yeah, I mean, you know, the challenge is it's, you know, the, the money is there. The VCs still have the money the valuations have changed so so it's the multiples right so so the multiples got out of whack from historicals so now they're back down to earth or everyone is saying oh we're getting a down round we're getting squeezed and yes but you the rounds that were raised in the last couple of years were were Crazy. just didn't make sense were too high so so you have to get folks their heads around that i mean ultimately at the end of the day you know i'll talk with some founders and, and they they may not appreciate the bluntness, but it's like, you know, zero times anything is zero. So if you have no cash, you have no opportunity. Yes, you might get squeezed. Yes, you get might diluted. Yes, you might lose control. Hopefully you're, you know, you know, hopefully that's not the case. But even if, even if at the end of the day, if you can kind of like, you know, put a check on your ego and say, okay, what is the best thing I can do to get an outcome? And if it's, if it's, you know, bringing in either someone else or, or getting that investor that maybe they're, maybe they're, you know, right sizing the valuation, but they're the right person to help scale it and have an opportunity for an exit. I mean, you, you've got to, you got to think beyond that. And then, you know, you know, entrepreneurs, serial entrepreneurs, obviously if it's their first time, you know, they're going to learn from that. And, and hopefully in the next, next go arounds that, you know, they're, they take that all that knowledge in, into into ch into place when they go for fundraising the for their next venture. Totally, it's like, uh, would you rather own like fifty percent of one watermelon or like eight percent of a watermelon farm? It's like I think I'll take the <laughs> I'll take the farm. Honestly, it's just worth more. Um, yeah, it, it's a, it's tough. It's 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 tough. I mean, you know, you invest your blood, sweat, and tears into this venture, and no one wants to give any of it up and you, you, you shouldn't, I mean, but there's very few folks. I mean, no, you know, not everyone could be Mark Zuckerberg and, and, and really control their destiny throughout. It's just, that's, that's a, that's super rare, but you see that, you know, you see those, that's the outcomes you see on TV. And so it's like, why should I give anything up? It's like, well, it's, that's, that's not the typical. <laughs> totally. All right. I, I love all that. I want to keep us moving. I want, I, you know, Scott, I could probably talk to you for a very long time. So I might have to start uh, condensing <laughs> some of these questions. But no problem. I want to talk about sort of the, the inflection points where you're either starting to outgrow fractional CFO services, or it's time to bring that team in-house. Because obviously, like, you're not going to work with companies forever. I was surprised to hear that you guys are working with clients as late as like Series C, because in my head, you know, that's usually like, you know, you should have like a full in-house team. So I'm curious, 
what those inflection points look like and how that transition works as you start to help companies bring on their in-house hires. So typically, you know, one, one it's economics, you know, our bill will get, to, there'll be a lot of work going on. There'll be complex, complex business activities going on and scaling. And, and the, they'll look at economic and they say, well, I can, I can hire someone in-house and, and that, that starts to make sense. We're also, you know, if, if the complexity of the business will require someone to be in-house, just, to, you know, the, the founders just now need their, their finance team 24 seven. And, and, you know, we're working with multiple clients, so it's, we can't always be there. We, we do everything we can, but it, it's, it's hard to be the only com competing requests all at once. And I think, you know, where we are still engaged with companies in the later stages is, is they'll build a team, but they'll still use us for certain pieces of, mm -hmm. of, of, you know, the puzzle. So maybe, maybe we're working on RevRec projects. Maybe they built the accounting team, but they want, you know, still want us on the FPNA side. Maybe they have built, you know, they have the controller as their, their top finance person. They have a whole org, but they want the CFO to come in and provide guidance and support. So that's how we'll stay longer, longer engagement with our, our clients gotcha. in our companies. You mentioned earlier that, that you have actually helped clients bring on those in-house hires, like as you're working with them. And that's something we get asked a lot is like just finding the right people. Like, so I'm curious if you have any tips for finding the right candidates and finding the right people to fill those early finance and accounting roles. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, for for us, you know, one is one is we'll we'll provide the job description. We'll help help build that job description. We'll go through the interview process with them and bring bring on their team. We have recruiters in house that we can actually do recruiting engagements with our our companies to help find those teams. You know, I, I understand the industry you're in. Understand, you know, who are the competitors out there that that are the model competitors. Look at you know, go through LinkedIn and looked at, look at folks backgrounds and make sure it makes sense. You know, I, I would say just because people are not actively looking, those, those are the ones that you can come knock on their door and you'll, you'll be surprised that they might get interested in, in, in what you're doing and get excited about that and, and be willing to make a move. And, and I think a lot of the network, I mean, I'm working with a company where they have, you know, a history with Tesla and, and, and folks that are coming from that that realm and and they already know like literally like okay when that person's ready i i know we're gonna hire that person and and they they kind of already have that planned out even on the accounting on, on all levels like wow. engineering accounting sales marketing they, they just kind of have all those folks already earmarked for when they're ready to to come over wow uh i've, I've always been impressed by uh so i i was in the same boat i, I wasn't like i didn't apply for this job at, at mosaic like i just ended up networking with our co-founder. We were in like an agency agreement and he, that's like one of his best skills. I don't know how he does it, but he just seems to be constantly in recruiting mode. Like even like just finding interesting people, finding people that are in unique positions to maybe help Mosaic someday. It's really just like planting seeds and like, you know, someday you're going to come back and it's like when they're ready, like I'll have already kind of put my foot in the door there. Yeah, you know, I think with with the, you know, with the with the pandemic being remote, there's a lot of organizations you can be a part of where now now you get exposure. You don't have to show up at, at an event downtown. You can now click into Slack channels and so forth. And so there's a lot of a lot of more ways to kind of get reach out to folks and, and get in front of folks, which is which is powerful these days. Um, all right, Scott, I'm going to turn the last I have I have like three we'll call it three ish questions left. I'm going to turn this into a semi like lightning round because again, otherwise no I'll just be with you for like three hours <laughs> and we'll just keep chatting. That's uh, great. So, yeah. yeah. So the, the first one I want to talk about is like the, the, the tech side. And we talked a lot about the data cleanup and things like that. Um, but I've asked a few, you know, finance pros in the past, like the spreadsheets versus software sort of debate in the industry right now, like something like mosaic where we're like, we're going to build a platform. You're going to come in, you're going to use something like this versus like spreadsheet plugins or just straight up using Excel from the, your side where you're coming in like externally to help these clients. Like I'm curious where you stand on kind of the future of finance software versus spreadsheets. Yeah, we're definitely intentional at Ativo to, to move towards platforms. So, you know, the Excel extenders 
it, you know, we're still in Excel, so it's not quite solving, fully solving the problem. So platforms like Mosaic on the FP&A side, where, you know, the, the time spent to set up a model in Excel and set up Mosaic is, is roughly the same. But the back end is where you leverage all the benefits of, of the reporting, the dashboarding, the immediate uh, budget to actual reporting. It's, 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 you know, that's the time saver. And that's where, you know, we, we get to take our, our, um, you know, the kind of the spreadsheet jockeying, we turn that into more strategic analysis and, and review. Love it. Uh, need to, I would be remiss at this point in july 2023 if i didn't ask you if you had thoughts on ai in finance do you have personal affinity for it are there any clients doing interesting things with it already ai is 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 really intriguing interesting i think there's there's you know from a client perspective i work with a client in the medical records space and so ingesting data and having that data be being populated across the record so cutting out manual entry and then using that data to do automatic scheduling and reminders and making sure that, Hey, you know, we keep patients on track with, with their, their medical, you know, their medical programs and so forth, what they're doing, and then keep doctors updated real time so that, that all of that care is done, done well and relevant. And so that's what one of my clients is doing on the firm initiative for me, thinking about fp is we have a lot of, you know, we work with over 250 companies. At the firm, we're we're ninety plus consultants with with over two hundred fifty companies. How you know? I would love a one click of button of of benchmark data, like you know, of our clients in the various industries that we have. How do they benchmark out by you know round amounts raised, you know, revenue metrics, headcount metrics? How do I how do I get that data? And so I can do that manually, which is super painful of like downloading spreadsheets and and typing things into cells and figuring that stuff out how how can ai help us do that and i'm and, and actively trying to figure out you know solve that for for the firm love it i will clip this send it to the product team and they will you know i'm not going to promise that they'll fix that problem but i would like them to as well i would also like benchmark data so it's a good use case for sure uh, and i'm sure it's on the horizon so Fingers crossed. I want to say that I appreciate you indulging my lightning round efforts here. And so we're doing great. <laughs> and I've got two more questions for you. One more is for anyone listening that has not hired a company like a TiVo, a fractional CFO, or a consulting firm, any tips you have for evaluating partners and kind of choosing your path there? So understand, you know, what's at the firm. Are they a fully integrated firm? Are they specialized in a certain part of accounting and, and finance? You know, fully integrated firms have, you know, you can, you can grow more with, with the firm, uh, and, and, uh, or, or if you just need that specific need, then it's okay to work with that specific need. We, you know, we at Ativo are fully integrated. We will partner, you know, we'll, we'll work around with other partners, understand what the firms do and deliver and what they do and don't deliver and how they're partnered to handle those activities and services that they don't provide. Again, we focus on on deep partnerships across the areas that we don't uh, do ourselves, and we have multiple op options to go through, so we can present our clients with different different partners that we're tight with that that can help provide that. And I think one key thing is understand how much the firms invest in their people, and, and what does that look like. So we we at Ativo, the the partners have made a very intentional effort to invest in our team. We have lunch and learns, we have mentorship programs, we have offsites to kind of really understand issues, understand, you know, firm policies, procedures, and how we help, help scale our companies up as they grow. Love that. Amazing. So I've got one last question for you, Scott. I ask everyone that comes on, what is one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you started your career in finance? You know, I, I, yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think everyone says that on your podcast, as I've heard, what I keep coming back to is I wish I learned how to better appreciate and leverage my network yeah. and really go after, you know, stronger mentors in, in my career, being on the other side now, being, you know, the CFO with, with a TiVo, we all have mentees. We have a mentor as well. And, and just really leaning into that, that process, you know, I've 
being, you know, going into startups, being a team of one, being overwhelmed, I felt, oh, my network's overwhelmed. I can't bother them. They, they don't have time for me. I don't have time. I, you, you can always make time. And, and now being on the other side later in my career, as you can, you know, we're, we're running out of time here. You can see, I, I, I love talking. I love great. sharing what I know. And, and I think I didn't, you know, you, you, people love to really, you know, validate what they've done their entire career and impart that knowledge and don't be afraid to reach out to folks. I mean, if, if someone's really, if it's a hard sell on me, yeah, I'm not going to pick up a sales call unless I really need that product. But I have a lot of founders coming and say, Hey, help me understand what we're doing. You know, I'd love to pick your brain on, on, is this something that's valuable in general? Not, not so much as a sales call. And that's, that's interesting. That's, that's a great conversation to have. And, and I, you know, I try to have more time in my day to, to do that. I love that. Anyone who's listening that has listened to enough of these knows that I'll always say that it's applicable, not just to finance, but to, to everyone else as well. Cause I, I feel the same way when somebody reaches out to me on LinkedIn, they're like, oh, like I'm, I'm trying to start this podcast. Like, what do you, and I'm like, I'll, I'll chat about this all day. This is great. I love talking to people about what I do and, and you know, doesn't have to be, you know, hard sell or anything. So I think that's a great point. Scott, I really appreciate you being here again. Appreciate you indulging my rapid fire question. Normally I would just skip the questions, but I thought the last few we had were really good ones. So I was like excited to get your, your take, but uh, for now I want to turn the floor over to you. Where can people go to connect with you to learn more about a TiVo, to maybe work with a TiVo if they are in that position, the floor is yours, whatever you would like to, to pitch and promote. Great. No, I appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. It's been, it's been a pleasure speaking with you and, and, and happy to go through your questions. You know, I, the best for me is LinkedIn, you know, Scott Mollett, M-O-L-L-O-T on LinkedIn. Also, we have TiVo Partners, uh, com is a good way to kind of look at, see what we do at a TiVo, kind of get a, get the, our story. As you're scaling and growing, as you're, as you're even just embarking on your journey with your company, definitely speak with someone like us and, and get some advice up front. You know, we, you don't have to do full engagements. You, you can, you know, we can have a discussion on what it looks like. And a lot of times I speak with early stage founders and, and give them a little bit of advice and they'll come back later when they're ready to do a full engagement. Love it. Well, Scott, thanks again for being here. I really appreciate it. I think clearly we're going to need a part two at some point because, you know, there's a lot to go through and I think you and I could probably chat for a lot longer, but yeah, thanks for being on the roll forward. Hope we can do it. No, that was great. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Scott. Thank you for checking out this episode of The Roll Forward. This show is powered by Mosaic, a strategic finance platform that transforms the way business gets done. If you enjoyed what you learned in this episode, make sure to follow The Roll Forward wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Or visit mosaic.tech slash podcast to get immediate access to all of the latest episodes. 